Okay, good day and welcome to Island Perspective, Preservation, Sustainability and the Environment. My name is Alana Anderson and I will be your moderator to, for today's panel. This panel is a collaborative effort by several island members of the International National Trust Organization or more commonly known as INTU. INTU's mission is to promote the conservation and enhancement of the heritage of all nations for the benefit of the people of the world and future generations. INTU includes more than 80 trusts in 56 countries around the world. The regional groups include the Caribbean Conference of National Trusts, INTU Africa, Asia Heritage Networks. All of our panelists today are members of INTU, as well as the United States National Trust. INTU is a young organization, and it was created to provide a platform and access to expert advice from anything from setting up a national trust to running it and the possible challenges a trust may face. INTU understands that there is no one size fits all approach, hence why the diversity of its membership is so important so that we can draw on each other's experiences and take from them the aspects that pertain to each trust respectively. The objective is to create a collaborative network and to push forward the national trust movement. Every year, INTU offers a variety of programs, webinars, and conferences. The first conference being in Bali in 2007. The conferences in particular are geared towards collaboration, sharing of information, while immersing participants in a cultural experience. Bermuda played host in 2019 to the, in, to Intos, into the, to the International National Trust Conference. Today's panelists are Bijnu Tulisi. Bijnu has worked at the St. Lucia National Trust since 2004, having started his professional career as a science teacher in his native Guyana. He has worked as a consultant for UN bodies, the EU and the Institute of Sustainable Development on Climate Change and Sustainable Development in the Caribbean. Ingrid Henry. Ingrid is a program director for the Societe Audubon Haiti's National Trust, which manages the Grand Voice National, National Natural Park in Haiti. Ms. Henrys has a master's degree in international agro development engineering and topical biodiversity and conservation. She is currently completing a diploma in applied permaculture design with the International Permacultural University of Argentina. She was the head of the National Sanitation Department in Haiti before having experiences with international NGOs in the agricultural and environmental sector. Yvonne Sanabria. Yvonne is the coordinator of history and culture at Para Naturaleza, where she leads the land's trust's renewed focus on cultural programming, historic preservation awareness, and collections management. After Hurricane Maria struck, Puerto Rico in 2017, she coordinated the first and largest survey of damages to historic places and has continued to support the owners and caretakers of these sites during the island's slow recovery. She is also in charge of Paranaturaleza Museum's quality collection of cultural artifacts, as well as advancing programming and interpretation on the, the historical and cultural aspects of Paranaturaleza's properties. Today, I am your mo moderator, Alana Anderson. I am a native Bermudian and have been involved with the Bermuda National Trust since birth. While my day job is in reinsurance, I have been an avid supporter of the trust in a variety of ways. As a volunteer, committee member, council member, and most recently as president or chair. The mission of the trust has always been a passion of mine and I'm proud to serve my island home in this capacity. I want to thank the National Trust for Historic Preservation and INTO for the opportunity to make this presentation at this Past Forward Conference. I'm Vishnu Tulsi, Director of the St. Lucia National Trust, obviously located in St. Lucia, which is a small island in the Eastern Caribbean, um, 616 square kilometers, about 182 people. 
Um, St. Lucia has a rich history, um, mainly driven by European interests um, and changed hands between the British and the French um, 14 times. All of this because of its strategic location and, and by extension, its military um, significance. Um, the St. Lucia National Trust was created in 1975 by an act of parliament and it was created to protect the natural, cultural, historic, prehistoric, submarine and subterranean heritage of St. Lucia. Uh, quite a mouthful um, and we do the best we can with a small staff of about 32 persons. Um, we manage 25 sites and we do all of this with a budget of 900,000 US dollars, um, all of which we raise on our own. Um, our projects are funded through grants. Um, they, there are several challenges that we face. Um, the greatest being the low appreciation for heritage assets and their importance. Um, you would notice in the slide that I have government support on the both opportunities and challenges. Um, we have a very good working relationship with the technical arms of government. We collaborate very closely with them especially those agencies responsible for um, natural resource management. But at the highest levels of government, there isn't the level of appreciation one would hope for um, to, to protect and preserve our heritage. Um, the, there are significant pressures driven mainly by development and tourism related development at that, for that. Uh, in addition to which climate change is not helping the situation because it is um, creating lots of um, issues, um, especially in the natural heritage. Um, it is impacting on biodiversity, it's impacting on livelihood issues, and also um, impacting on our coastlines and coastal resources. The advent of COVID has not helped us because um, it has dried up our income streams and we are now really struggling to, to maintain our work and our staff. Um, the future um, will really depend on how we are able to emerge from the COVID situation. Uh, the, the St. Lucia National Trust's greatest strength is that it is a non-governmental organization, a membership organization um, managed by members, um, by a council elected from among its members. And because we are non-governmental, we are an independent voice that, that, that champions heritage conservation in all the areas that we are responsible for. Having said that, I must confess and admit that um, our focus has to date been in the natural heritage um, sphere because it is easier to attract grant funding for environmental projects. But we have recently started refocusing and looking at the built heritage. Um, as mentioned earlier, climate change is and, and its impact on sustainability is one of the areas we are concerned with. Um, there are impacts on, on landscapes, on livelihoods, and a significant threat to biodiversity. Um, we do a lot of work in that area in terms of species conservation, promoting livelihoods based on natural resources. And also we're doing work in the marine area, looking at coral reef restoration, and working with the mangroves to, to assist with the coal fisheries and um, coal, uh, climate change adaptation. Um, tourism is a, is a grave threat to our heritage assets because most of the plants are built in areas which were originally occupied by plantations and the Caribs and Arawaks. And, and through their construction, these, these places are being um, destroyed. Uh, we are right now in a battle with the developer to try and protect uh, a, an Amerindian burial site. Um, the overcrowding caused by tourism and the exclusion of res residents from areas that they traditionally use, used is another area of struggle for us. But we are um, moving ahead with uh, in a number of areas focusing, like I said, on built heritage, 
we have developed a system of protected areas for safe pollution, which we've identified areas worthy of protection. They include both built and natural heritage. And we have a staff in which, uh, among whom we have experts in both natural and built heritage areas. So, and, and we are now trying to, like I said, bring built heritage back on stream. Um, because we are a non-governmental organization, it makes it easier for, for us to access external funding. And in collaboration with the government agencies, technical agencies of government, sorry, we are able to attract grant funding, sometimes in collaboration with them, sometimes independent of them, to, to implement projects in both the built and natural heritage conservation areas. Um, that is the St. Lucia National Trust and what we do. And I take this opportunity to thank you for, to, for this present, to make, to be allowed to make this presentation. Sorry. And here you see a collage of photographs showing some of the areas in which we work, biodiversity conservation, um, public education and outreach, and restoration works. Thanks again. Okay. I am Ingrid Alice from Haiti National Trust, um, the first trust like this in Haiti created in 2017. So I'm going to present what we, the type of work we are doing in Haiti and present more about Haiti. So the Republic of Haiti is the first black nation that was, that became independent in 1804. So Haiti is in the Caribbean, is part of the Caribbean biodiversity hotspot. And we share the same island with the Dominican Republic. So Haiti has only one third in, in surface of this island called Hispaniola or Quisqueya. So the surf, surface of Haiti is 27,750 square kilometers. And even if we have we are part of the biodiversity hotspot of the Caribbean. A study launched in, in 2018 showed that we have less than 1% of the virgin forest in, of Haiti left. But um, in Haiti, there is a national agency for protected areas, in short of protected areas, terrestrial and marine protected areas. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, um, there is the government and this agency have no, don't have really the means, the financial means to take care of all the protected areas of the country or areas to be protected. So uh, Haiti National Trust was created with the objective of saving and protecting environment and biodiversity of Haiti for the future generations. And one of the first work we started doing it was even it to, to identify biodiversity hotspots in, in the country and work with the government to declare those areas as protected areas. So the work done, there are already 12 biodiversity hotspots identified and declared as protected areas. And we, the, the idea for Haiti National Trust is also to propose another model for managing those protected areas. So in, in 2018, ha Haiti National Trust purchased a uh, part of a national park, Gobwa National Park. It's in the Southern Peninsula of Haiti uh, in, in the, to show, to try to manage, to privately manage a protected area in, in Haiti. The history of Gobwa, as a biodiversity hotspot, it was gifted to uh, an army general in 1811 for, for his service. So it has public and private lands and the protected area itself has a surface of 370 hectares. And the part Haiti National Trust purchase, it's about 272 hectares. And so not the entire park. Um, the park has a lot of biodiversity of fauna and flora. We have several species of birds or frogs or vertebrates, a species of bat, and, uh, but it is threatened by 
deforestation because there are people living in the park and for economic reasons, they deforest the park. So in this picture, you can see one of the impacts of deforestation, how the land is degraded. And this is a really a threat for the villages below the park. And also agriculture, especially slash and burn agriculture being, being held in the park. So one of the first things we started when, when we purchased the land, it, it was to try to, to preserve some species like the Magnolia ekmani, which is an endemic species to the island. Here you can see a nursery of Magnolia. So we, we went to collect the seeds and to plant the Magnolia again back in the forest. The idea is really to work close with the people living in the protected area and not having them to, to leave the protected area. So it's trying to mix the street conservation with social and, and with social work with the people. So basically this is what I really wanted to, to present to you today. And our idea is to keep doing, to see if Gambois can really be a model in Haiti and if we could uh, spread this type of model of privately managed land with an MOU with the government to help protecting and, and preserving those areas. So I really thank you for, for your attention and thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you to Intu and to the National Trust for Historic Preservation. Um, I'd like to begin by giving you some background about Puerto Rico. The colonial period in Puerto Rico began in 1493 with the arrival of Christopher Columbus during his second voyage. Before that, uh, Puerto Rico was inhabited by Native Americans, the Taino Indians, whose population declined severely with the conquest and, and were um, extinguished by the uh, 1600s, even though their legacy remains with us today. We were a Spanish colony until 1898, when we became a US territory after the Spanish-American War. Um, after the change of sovereignty, Puerto Rico underwent unprecedented transformation at all levels. Um, uh, geographically, most people don't realize that Puerto Rico is an archipelago. The main island is just a little smaller than Connecticut. Next slide, please. Regarding uh, Puerto Rico's natural heritage, we're located, as, as Ingrid mentioned, we are located in the Caribbean uh, hotspot. It's one of the world's richest biological hotspots, uh, which are regions of rich diversity that are threatened because of loss of habitat. We have 36 ecosystems, including rainforests, dry forests, coastal ecosystems, wetlands. We have high endemism and diversity of flora. For instance, we have over 250 endemic species of plants and are one of the five richest plant areas in the US. In terms of heritage, we have over 8,000 sites listed in the National Register of Historic Places or in our local register. Also San Juan's defensive structures are a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, although there are numerous pre-Columbian sites and structures dating from the early, from the 16th century onwards, like the San Juan Cathedral that was built in, begun to be built in 1521, and the governor's mansion in 1533, uh, most of our historic uh, sites um, date from the second half of the 19th century onwards. Um, the materials are a mixture of brick, uh, of, um, um, of mamposteria, which is a mixture of brick, stone, and limestone, and wood, a lot of wood, and, and just brick. And Puerto Rico's built heritage is a showcase of sustainable design and construction for the tropics. Next slide, please. When, after 1898, Puerto Rico became a sugar economy. And in the late 40s and 50s, uh, we shifted to a new economic model, uh, Operation Bootstrap, that was based on an industrial, an industrial based uh, model. By the 1960s, there were serious concerns about contamination from the manufacturing operations and oil refineries that had been uh, establishing in the island. So that is the backdrop for the creation of the Conservation Trust of Puerto Rico. We were established by the US government and the Puerto Rico government to operate as an independent nonprofit. Um, in 2013, we uh, established our operational unit, Para la Naturaleza, 
Uh, we focus on nature, history, education, volunteers, communities, and agroecology. We currently have 184 employees. Um, in 2019, we had over 14,000 individuals engaging with our offering, including 5,000 volunteers. Uh, we have the um, Land Trust Accredita Accreditation Commission seal that certifies that we meet the highest national US standards for excellence and conservation permanence. And we manage six sites that are listed in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, we uh, are a member of the National Trust and, and INTO, of course, the Land Trust Alliance and also the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Next slide, please. The conservation strategies that we pursue in terms of nature conservation include land protection through acquisition and conservation easements. We have a robust environmental education and interpretation program where all of our interpreters are certified by the National Association of Interpretation. Um, we have a uh, focus on habitat restoration, of course, is, and especially uh, we have a large reforestation goal. We aim to plant over 100,000 native and endemic trees per year. We have five nurseries, five, three nurseries for that. Uh, in community conservation, we like to empower communities to become stewards of their environment and promote sustainable practices. And uh, even though the Conservation Trust of Puerto Rico was established initially as a land conservation organization, the preservation of the historic sites in our newly acquired lands was always a priority. Our first director, who sadly passed away just a few uh, weeks ago, uh, was a conservation architect. Um, in recent years, we have amplified our voice to promote heritage conservation beyond our properties. For instance, by promoting funding opportunities like the Sacred Places, uh, <clears throat> opportunity, and we also nominated the Ponce Historic Zone to the 11 most endangered historic sites, which was uh, just announced uh, last month. We're also conducting archaeological excavations at two sites that are threatened by climate change. So, so the impact of, of climate change on cultural resources is a big concern to us. Next slide, please. Our recent initiatives, right after Hurricane Maria, um, uh, we, we've been very vocal about promoting historic preservation through our Map of History program. It was Map of History was initially a survey of hurricane damages to historic sites, but it evolved into a program to follow up recovery, uh, identify the needs of owners and the challenges they face, provide support to the owners and custodians of historic sites. Um, we just launched also a solidarity fund uh, which uh, has a preservation component so that um, we can provide micro grants to the owners of historic properties that never got the help that they needed to repair, to repair the hurricane, hurricane Maria's damages. Uh, we have ongoing collaborations with the National Trust and Main Street, Main Street Center and also with some government organizations here. And we are bringing our message uh, through multiple channels, including um, social media, we're very active in social media. We have a documentary about the map of history survey and results and the experience uh, after the hurricane that are available, that is available online. And we are also working with uh, organization in Chicago to create an exhibition of, of, the, of, of that map of history survey and, and what we found. Next slide, please. Um, our challenges in terms of history preservation is the slow to stalled post hurricane recovery, um, uh, Hurricane Maria, and, and the difficulty of conveying the importance of historic preservation amid competing priorities, given the scale of the devastation. The recovery depends entirely on the owners. Many are elderly and lack the knowledge or the energy uh, to manage and protect their historic site. There's little funds available and that what, what, what is available is just not enough to cover the repairs to historic sites. There's also a huge lack of skilled labor, uh, especially trained in the, in the restoration arts. Uh, there's a bias against wood and that affects uh, most of the structures that we have that are, that are built in wood. And there's also the threat of climate change, of course. But there are also opportunities to focus on the resilience of these structures that have been battered by dozens of hurricanes throughout their history and are still standing. It also gives us the opportunity to focus on sustainability. 
Puerto Rico's uh, historic structures are full of examples of solutions to tropical conditions. These resilient places have much to teach us about sustainable design, sustainable construction, and sustainable living. And we finally have the opportunity to show that marrying nature and heritage conservation is relevant today more than ever. And that gives us a lot of hope. I want to leave you with a few photos. Next slide, please, because I'd like to leave you with a few uh, photos of our sites. Um, we have uh, at the top left, we have the Culebrita Lighthouse, which we are in the process of restoring. We have uh, visitors that engage with our historic properties and natural sites. And, uh, and the last slide, it's, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> That's the lighthouse um, in, in Fajardo. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank everybody so far today and to give you a little insight onto the Bermuda National Trust. Our tagline is for everyone forever. Um, Bermuda is actually a group of islands. It's not just one island. Um, and it's joined together by, by numerous um, bridges and other other um, and numerous bridges. Um, and we actually say that it's in the, the islands form the shape of a fish hook. Uh, we have a population of about 64,000. Um, and actually our actual total land mass, uh, we're quite small, we're only 22 square miles. Um, in kilometers, it's only 53 square kilometers when you put it in comparison to some of our other panelists' um, island size. We are Brit British territory, and we have been ever since um, our colonization, since the early 1600s. Um, our main industry here, um, initially, um, besides some very early farming of tobacco, onions, and Easter lilies, um, we then ventured into tourism. Um, however, since the 1980s, um, that our main industry um, turned to international business. Um, and this significantly um, significantly changed the di the dynamic of um, dynamic of Bermuda, especially at, in the wake of Hurricane Andrew, when there was quite a few international businesses that that sprung up during that time. Uh, Bermuda is known for our beautiful pink sand beaches, um, our wonderful Bermudian hospitality. Um, and as I mentioned before, we were able to play host to INTO's International National Trust Conference in 2019. And of course, our Bermuda shorts. The Bermuda National Trust, um, similar to St. Lucia, we were created by an act in 1969, which effectively was passed in 1970. So this is actually our 50th year, uh, 50th anniversary of the passing of our act. Um, and we are actually the largest single land owner besides the Bermuda government. We have approximately 270 acres, which is comprised of about 82, 82 properties. And this is both historic houses, islands, gardens, cemeteries, nature reserves, and some coastline. Um, our mission as many other national trusts is to protect, um, acquire and conserving land, um, building and artifacts and inspiring appreciation and stewardship through advocacy, research, education, and participation. We also offer a quite diverse education program. Um, and uh, through, we actually are linked through the Cambridge education system and we provide social studies classes for, for both public and private schools um, in Bermuda. Uh, in terms of education for, non-students, uh, we do trust talks um, and they're pretty much relevant, very relevant now, especially now that we're doing them virtually as a result of the pandemic. Anyone can sign up, whether you're a member or not. Um, and most recently we've been doing um, talks on Bermuda Caves and a two-part series on Waterville, which is Bermuda National Trust headquarters. It's a historic, we both look at both the architecture and the people who live there. wanted to share some beautiful images of Bermuda um, and we've got our Bermuda shorts right there in the middle. Um, uh, Waterville, which is our, our headquarters. Um, the picture though on the top right is the gem of the, National, of the Bermuda National Trust. Um, it is Birdmont Museum. Um, it is one of Bermuda's oldest homes um, and uh, we're quite fortunate to have it. Um, our cemeteries, our Fanny Fox, um, you know, if, if it wasn't for the National Trust, 
um, Bermuda would actually look very, very different. Um, and when I think of, when I drive past our nature reserves and, um, and, and some of our coastline and then realize that if they weren't there, um, it would be, it, Bermuda would not be the place that it is, that it is now. And it's because, it's because of the Bermuda National Trust and the National Trust model um, that we're able to tell the stories of, of our past so we can help people to understand their importance in our present but also to help shape what our future looks like. So it's it's extremely important. I feel that the National Trust is, is an extremely important body um, here on island. Um, and with that, we're gonna go into our group presentation, well, our group discussion. Um, and and after, shortly after that, it will be questions and answers. So thank you all today. Thank you everybody for joining our panel today. Um, and thank you to the panelists for your presentations. Um, there are a lot of information there. Um, and today we're just gonna go through a couple of questions, open up for questions from, from the attendees. Um, Vishnu, you had mentioned uh, that strong policy is needed uh, in order to make an impactful change. And we've seen in other island locations, such as the Bahamas, um, the ban on single use, use plastics, which was put forth, uh, well, um, I think they initially um, mentioned it in 2019, but became law in 2020. And prior to this, we've seen in the Pacific Islands of Palau, uh, where they have actually designated marine reserves um, to help um, with fish stocks and to, to restore the, the ecosystems. What sort of policies do you think St. Lucia should implement in order to tackle the number of growing threats to your island? Um, in terms of plastics, um, we have recently banned um, single-use plastics and styrofoam um, so that there is some movement in that area. Um, St. Lucia has quite a robust um, policy and legislative framework for managing the environment. The problem is um, enforcement. And um, that is where the weaknesses are. Um, we are trying, we, as we are outside of government, but we work with government agencies, for example, to develop the legislation on plastics. Um, and we are currently working on, on an initiative to get St. Lucia to join on to the ESCAZU agreement, which is about public access to information and environmental justice. Um, we feel that that's the next direction in which we need to go to empowerment of the population through information, education, and regulations so that people could make more informed decisions, not only in the context of how they interact with and um, degrade um, environmental resources, but also how they could respond if they see it happening and need to do something about it. Uh, so in, in, in summary, I think that um, enforcement is necessary um, for what the, the laws that exist, but perhaps more importantly, it's empowerment. Well, em enforcement, I agree. Empowerment, definitely. I think education is definitely high up there. Um, and I, I could give you many examples in Bermuda. One from me, actually. Um, there, there are laws here that restrict people from swimming in caves. And um, I know when I grew up, that's what, that's what we did as kids, you know, we used to jump in the caves. And it wasn't until actually recently, one of our trust talks, go to our website, www.bnt.bm, um, where I learned about the, the unique species that are only found here in Bermuda and only found in our caves. And all of a sudden that law became a lot more real to me. And then, just having somebody enforce it. I think as a teenager, had somebody, um, had I been swimming in a cave and I'd been given uh, given a ticket, um, I probably wouldn't, it didn't affect me as much as it does now, understanding, knowing why we don't. So I, I do feel education is extremely important in that regard, in that regard as well. I agree absolutely. Um, we do a lot of talks with schools and we do, well, we have gone virtual now doing virtual um, lectures and presentations. And whereas before COVID, we may have 60 to 100 persons in a room. Now, when we do our events, we get in the thousands. 
um, and, and we see people from all over the globe, um, because St. Lucians live all over the world, um, are tuning in. So that's a positive side to this, but I'm um, coming back to the education bit. Um, a number of young adults are now joining the St. Lucia National Trust, and many ask them why. They remember 20 years ago or 15 years ago, they attended a lecture or we came to their school and, uh, and, and discussed something or they went on one of our hikes or field trips and, and they wanted, they want more of that. So yes, absolutely, education is central. In fact, the all behavioral change. Bon, sort of the same question for you um, in regards to legislation and education and enforcement. Uh, do you feel that um, besides those things, what, what else is needed to have a big, big impact to push your national trust and of forward? Well, there's definitely need more for more protections of our natural, um, of, of our um, environment and, and ecosystem. Uh, um, there's also need, needs to be a lot more awareness about um, the, the uh, role, the important role that ecosystem conservation has on our collective well-being. Uh, in terms of historic preservation, I would say that Puerto Rico really needs incentives to facilitate investment in historic downtowns and to motivate activity in, in our historic downtowns. And we also need, uh, we badly need uh, an organization that is devoted to providing services to the stewards of our historic heritage um, because they are, um, they, they, they need more support and information. Actually, to both of you, what do you, where is the balance between what you push in, in regards to tourism and then what you push in regards to, to your local community? Like where, what is the balance? Um, in St. Lucia, we don't distinguish between what we do for tourists or locals. We do it for the conservation good. Um, we have found, and I think it's common worldwide, that there is a growing interest by tourists in heritage and, and uh, in, in, in the past and in understanding the destinations that they visit. So we do not make that distinction. In fact, um, the tourism sector benefits tremendously from what we do, but not because we do it for the tourism sector. Um, we do it for the heritage value, like you said. I couldn't have said it better myself. That's exactly what we do as well. Okay. Um, Yvonne, the, it's a broad mission in caring for, maintaining, educating, advocating for built natural and cultural heritage. It's a huge undertaking. It isn't hard to see how dividing time and resources into many buckets can be challenging, let alone resource draining. However, there are benefits. Can you tell us some of the benefits? Well, I think that the first uh, thing to keep in mind is, is that the benefits are reciprocal. In, in uh, conservation of, of nature conservation and historic preservation are mutually beneficial. They help us understand our past and our, the historic uses of, our, of land. They help develop connections between people, land and history. Um, protecting land protects also the sites within and reducing contamination uh, um, uh, can, can help protect our historic structures. And it also, especially, uh, it, it also really gives us an opportunity to focus on the sustainable use of the resources in historic uh, uh, construction and 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 their um, uh, design, uh, sustainable design. But we, the our organization, we, we are. Um, it, it's a broad. Uh, uh, we have um, um, we have a broad vision, but we also know that we don't we can't do this alone, and we have uh, we really are very strongly engaging um, people as stewards of nature and heritage. So we have um, um, a, a robust uh, uh, um, volunteer and and a program. We use uh, we engage volunteers, individual students and schools, corporations to advance our nature and heritage conservation goals. We also have uh, citizen science uh, uh, projects. 
um, we we get help from people uh, to uh, work in reforestation and maintenance of um, of nurse tree nurseries and development of of uh, um, plants of native and, and endangered uh, tree species archaeological lab work um, data collection such as bird counts and and they help volunteers also help us with managing our collection of objects um so so yeah we we count on on other people to help us and become stewards of their own heritage and surroundings which is uh something that that it's very important for us our, our main goal is to to conserve 33 percent of of puerto rico's uh lands by 2033 and and um making our work, our collective uh, need. This is something that Port, all of Puerto Rico needs. So, so making, uh, uh, helping people take ownership of that goal is also helping us, our organization and our island. Yeah. Um, Ingrid, I, but, well, actually all of us, we've all, all are susceptible to, to natural, natural disasters and the aftermath of that. And then sometimes basing balancing those basic needs of the community while trying to push forward a cultural programming or historic conservation agenda is, is challenging. How do you move these initiatives forward when your community requires shelter or water um, or a basic income? Okay, thank you for this question. The thing is for us to see how we can really manage it to, to make the community be allies having their, their needs met with the work we are doing. Like for example, we, we, we want to launch a project where we would do hydroelectricity from, from a river in the park. So in order to, to show the people that by protecting the forest, by keeping the forest alive, we keep the rivers with the, the amount of water they have and they can get electricity out of it while protecting still the frogs and the other species. So we are trying to find ways like this to really work with the people, try to fulfill their needs and make them be really working with us to see the importance of conserving the area and, and all the, the biodiversity in it. It's not, it's not obvious to always find a way to do it like this, but it's really the way we, we have to do it. Or, having a community shelter where education can be done, environmental education, and it could be also a place for them where when there is a hurricane or something like this or a storm, they could go and have a shelter. You have mentioned something to us during our conversations over the past couple of weeks when I had mentioned about the National Trust model being to connect people. And you had used the word spirituality. And I, I really liked that. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, especially with, with Grand Bois, what that spirituality aspect is to, to Haitians and the natives of, of Haiti and how much does it resonate with them? Okay, um, in Haiti, we, we have a culture of voodoo, which is a religion, but it's also a religion where nature, we are really connected to, to nature. Like the big, big endemic trees are really um, habitats for spirits, spirits of nature. So there is this big connection and nature is also the place where people can find the, the leaves for treatment for example, provided by the spirits of nature. So there is this respect when people go and collect their those leaves, they ask the plant before for, for its authorization and to say like, okay, I'm gonna take these leaves to, for, to, to cure this, this illness. But there is also since several decades, a disconnection with nature because we had the church trying to to destroy this connection to destroy the sacred trees so i would say that the the new generations are kind of more disconnected with nature but we hope that with the work we are doing we could help um revive this 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 connection with with nature it's really the way how to go with, with like this 
Ingrid, we actually have a question from um, the audience and they would like to know um, how your relationship is with government. And the second part of that question is, do, do, you feel, do they feel like you are trying to take over their work? Okay, I will quickly answer that. Our, we, we actually, we work with the government, like with the National Agency for Protected Area. We just signed a, an MOU, a Memory of Understanding with them, where they, they delegate the management of Grand Bois to us. Because they, the government is absolutely conscious of not having all the financial and human resources to manage all the protected areas. So the government doesn't feel that we are taking over their work, but they see us as partners helping with the work, helping in because they in places where they can't really do do the work. So we we sit together, we discuss the the strategy, what will be done, and what will be the part of each party, us and the government. Thank you. I think we're running, starting to run low on time. So if there's any other questions, um, would love for and for any attendees to um, to let and to put something in the chat. Um, otherwise, oh, thanks, Becker. Um, otherwise, I kind of want to end on like a ha on an exciting, happy, fun note. Um, I had asked the panelists um, if they could have one superpower uh, to help further the mission of the National Trust, what would that superpower be? Um, so let's go around. Vishnu, what would your what would your superpower be? What and what would you use it for? Think uh, X-Men here. Yes, um, to engender greater appreciation for heritage and its role in not only economic development, but also spiritual development. Um, to, ensure, to, to be able to have all St. Lucians understand and value that link and become part of this movement. Because at the end of the day, um, we, we can have a, a development that's not connected to history is really empty. And, and, and we need to strengthen that link. Yvonne, what would your superpower be? Yeah, that it's in this in a similar uh, line. Is it's 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 the it, it, it be like a, the ability to 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 communicate to people how how interdependent we are, um, our with our natural surroundings. I mean, their the ecosystem well being is our well being, and and we it's, it's the, the idea that 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 we need to to treat um, each other with respect and and balance i think that would be best for all of us here in puerto rico and i think uh, everywhere ingrid what would your superpower be yeah my superpower would be just like yvonne said but i would be more specific and like having the all the haitians being able to listen to nature to hear nature's voice the the tree the voice of the trees and all the beings in nature that would tell them how to live together, how to treat them, and how what they feel and what they need, what they can provide us. Thank you. Did we lose our? Okay, there. I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> Thank you all so much for your time today. Um, I have really enjoyed meeting you um, and I'm hoping that um, your information will be passed and passed out. Hopefully we can get the slide deck um, up for people um, so that they can have it um, as well as your contact information. Um, so thank you all very much for your, for your time today. Thank you.